I owned my first bike when I was uh, when I was eight years old in Florida. Maybe I owned a tricycle before that, but I don't remember it. But uh, it was an awesome bike. It was like a Red Schwinn something. I had a blind dog that used to chase me on that bike. This dog loved me so much that uh, he couldn't even see me, but he could only chase me by by hearing. It was on a gravel road, and I used to like tear ass down this gravel road. And uh, I always loved riding. I always, always loved riding. Like when I first started messengering in '88, I knew probably that that's what I was supposed to be doing. I could feel when I was riding and making money that that's what I was supposed to do, and it is what I'm supposed to do. And no matter what the society does to me, they, I've been in mental institutions. I've been in drug rehabs, I've been in prisons. I'll lie in bed and I'll, I'll think about riding. I'll have dreams where I'm riding. I'll hear the sound of traffic coming by and I'll feel sad that I'm not part of that flow if I'm not part of that flow. I love to ride. It's what I do. I rode from about 1982-83 to about 93, I wrote about 10 years, you know, and uh, uh, started this place, Mother's Messengers, back in 92. And so soon after that, I was off the road. Within two years, I was off the road, and messengers were, you know, other messengers were doing that, and I was back in, I was now in the office at that point. Can you fix the address on Run 108? Yes, I could. The whole idea is quick turnover. The faster we can deliver packages, the faster we can get onto new packages, and the more money people make. Well, someone calls in. They want something picked up from wherever they want it picked up and whatever it is. And they want it brought to wherever they want it going by whatever time they want it. And then we charge them accordingly. You know, in other words, like if you wanted to send uh, an envelope uh, from Midtown to Midtown, uh, with no particular rush, within an hour and a half, two hours, it's a seven dollar run, and we send somebody out to go get it. And usually our guys are out there already, and so we have them on radios, we have them on beepers, so we just get in touch with whoever's in that, uh, that area and uh, let them knock it out. Yo, Steve, it's Mo. Picking up from Business Week. 1221 Avenue of, 43rd floor, triple rush to focus. All right, rock and roll. Okay, rock and roll. Triple, what's time for that? Messengers work on commission. To make decent money, you have to make 25 runs a day, which is a lot of hustling, and that'll guarantee you at least $100 a day. 
uh, you know, messengering, people call up and everybody wants everything done like uh, yesterday. You know, so you're just trying to sort out the real yesterdays from the fake yesterdays. My name is Skeletor. Street now. Is that last name or is that both? That's my name, Skeletor. Name? <laughs> no, that's my nickname. Master of the Universe, Skeletor. My name is Will Lopez. Will Lopez. Oh, Ready? Man. From the Bronx. I'm going that way. Here I go. for many different reasons. It could be that they're a drug addict and they want to have lots of money to spend on drugs on the weekend. Or it could be that they have children and they want to support their kids. It could be that they can't stand being inside their fucking four walls all day and feeling like a prisoner. Did I say rent? Did I mention rent? It could be that they like to eat because, well, Let's see, I've been messaging since 1988. Basically, I know how to either dispatch, ride, or pick up cans or sell stolen goods. Um, I don't really like picking up cans because the beer spills all and then you smell like a wicked alcoholic. I don't really like selling stolen goods because first you have to steal them, and that's a stress that's worse than riding. Uh, I don't like welfare because it's nothing. It's nothing. I am faced with the alternative of ride or die. I mean, I'm not going to die riding. I'm way past even thinking about ever getting smashed. I mean, yeah, maybe my hand will get broken, maybe. But I'm not going to die. I'm not doing this. two jobs at the same time. Most importantly, I'm trying to get this message across to the world. The most important message has to do with the Lord Jesus. That is for everybody to repent and be dedicated to the Lord Jesus. And my second job, which is less important, is that I'm working as a, a bike courier. As you can see from, my, from the front of my jacket, the bike, uh, the flag on the bike and the back of my vest. I'm trying to get a message across. Check it out. Look at the back of my jacket. Check it out. See the flag on the bike?
That's the devil's building right there. 666. That's the devil's building, you know. I, I had a delivery there a couple of days ago. And as I was walking upstairs, I felt a strong conviction in my heart saying, why am I in this building? I'm a Christian. Jesus! How you doing, Jesus? Give me a blessing. Next foot. So as I was walking inside the building, I felt this, I felt, you know, a strong feeling in my heart. I said to myself, I didn't say it to myself, it's like, you know, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He said to me, what are you doing in this building, man? It's the devil's building. And I felt terrible. I felt really bad. When I came out of there, my whole day just fell apart. I met everything just went off whack, because I usually got like this set routine of things I want to do for the day. And my day goes pretty nice. But after walking in and out of that building, the whole day was shot. I had to repent and everything for walking in there and not refusing to take that delivery. All I had to do was tell the dispatcher, listen, I'm not going into the devil's building. Or if that's, that might be too extreme, I could have just told them, hey, I'm not going to that building. I don't like that building. Or if, he, if, if it looks like he's going to take that the wrong way, what I'll say is, give me another run. You work in New York City, you've, you've mastered this profession. Because there's guys in this city that are just fucking phenomenal. I mean phenomenal. You'd think by first sight that they were the biggest fucking losers you ever set eyes on. And they're out there and they're fucking winning every day. I mean, they're winning. They're doing, they're doing a, what you would do as a week's worth of work in a day. Because they have mastered the addresses, the cross streets, and the moves better than anybody else in any other city, any city. I don't care what city thinks that it's the best. You go to London, they're taking you on immediately. You go to Berlin, Paris, anywhere. New York is it for messengering. You could go anywhere else and say, oh, I'm gonna go messenger there. But I guarantee that once New York City is inside your blood, there's nothing like coming down 9th Avenue from the 50s all the way down to the fucking teens on one green light, same with second. It's called a wave. And this is a shit. That's all I got to say about New York. The lure of danger is very enticing for a messenger in New York City. Nothing is ever going to compare to what you're doing. Rough Riders, uptown. <laughs> People cannot do what you are doing riding out in the middle, dodging cars, and knowing what they're doing. There's nothing like it. There's nothing in the whole world like it. My name's Mark Zabo. I'm a New York City taxi cab driver. I've been driving for 30 years, and I've seen 
thousands upon thousands of messengers on bikes. They're dangerous. They drive against lights. They hit pedestrians. They cut across cars like uh, you're supposed to mind read what they're doing. They're a menace. They need to be trained. They need to be licensed. And they need to get tickets just like everybody else. Yeah, you guys. Gotta watch you guys. You're the danger. The battle is so bad that uh, it, it's like a battle of cars. <clears throat> I know the bi bicycle has no protection and yet I'll block him off. I won't give him any respect. And if I can cut in front of him, I'll cut in front of him. Because he created that kind of situation between us. Just like any, anything else that's created in this city. Maybe because there's too many people, it's too crowded, I really don't know. But it, it, it's a true statement when they say road rage. I mean, I've cut off a poor bike where I, afterwards I thought, imagine if I would have hit him. I could have killed him. I could have crippled him for nothing. You know? But, but all of a sudden I'm riding and this guy just zooms right in front. I don't have a chance to stop even. You know? So then I get mad and I go up to the next light. He's going straight. I'm turning. I'll wait till he comes close to me and I'm, then I'll turn. You know, to sort of show him that uh, he better learn a lesson. You know, you can't just do the stuff you want. Like that. This, this is not a bicycle thing. Does it look like a bicycle thing to you? These are cars out here. It's motors. It's dangerous out here. It's dangerous between car and car now. The battle seems to get worse. It's like a war zone out here. You know, but it was, a, it was a great job, you know. It's just, you just fly around, you feel free. You know, a lot of people look down on you, a lot of people envy you, a lot of people, you know, would spit on you as soon as, you know, you don't look at you. And uh, which didn't bother me because, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was part of a whole different culture. You know, there was the civilians, and then you have the police, the, mil the paramilitary, and then you have criminals, then you have outlaws. And bike messengers fall under the, the realm of outlaw. Mothers. Uh, back in 87, Ed Koch uh, proposed the bike ban, banning bikes from 59th Street to 34th Street uh, along 5th Park and Madison Avenues, which basically was an attack on, you know, associate economic group called the Bicycle Messengers, you know, because it didn't affect commuters because it wasn't during commuting time. And for you to single out one group and go, this is the problem with traffic or this is the problem, the big danger in New York, uh, was just unfair. Well, it was an effort to uh, regulate uh, bike messengers. I don't remember the details, uh, but uh, it uh, provided for registration and insurance and um, the bill came before me for signature after it had been passed by the city council and I decided uh, that uh, it was too onerous, too penalizing in a criminal way uh, bikers and uh, that I didn't want to uh, pass legislation, sign legislation that would give uh, these bikers, if they were convicted of uh, violations, uh, criminal records. Messengers are overwhelmingly uh, uh, young men and women uh, from the minority communities, and they have lots of problems now. I was not going to add uh, to their uh, future employability uh, by making them uh, subject uh, to criminal sanctions, which that particular legislation did. And so I vetoed it. I don't know uh, whether they passed subsequently legislation uh, that eliminated uh, that was uh, criminal sanctions uh, or not, and I don't know what the state of legislation is in the city today. I'm Sergeant Gary Weaver of the Manhattan Traffic Task Force Bicycle Squad. We're part of the New York City Police Department. I've been doing this work for the last year. And primarily what we do is uh, go after bike messengers who violate the law. They go through red lights, go the wrong way on the street, or ride on the sidewalk. When any of these three main conditions exist, we stop the bicycle messenger, obtain their identification, and issue them a summons. 
Yeah, we've had chases sometimes on occasion. Uh, they've gone on for a long period of time. One, one individual we chased started at Midtown, going all the way downtown. He was cutting through streets, and the only reason we were able to keep up with him is we used the radio, and we had different officers come different routes and intercept him, and we just stayed with him, and finally he just wore out. That's how we were able to get him. The sheer numbers and the use of the radio was able to overcome visibility. What you missed was he went through uh, two consecutive red lights at 40th Street, rolled halfway into the intersection and proceeded through the red light. At 41st, which is a marginal street, he went straight through. The fee is $100. He has 15 days to plead either guilty or not guilty. My wages are like $20 more a week than a ticket's going to cost me. Bicycle messengers feel that they own the road and should be out there and the motorists feel that the bicyclist has no place on a city street. So it's an uneasy truce that exists most of the time between the bicyclist and the motorist. Stop your bike. All right, All right here's the summons and your identification. All right, man. Great. Right. Got to follow the same rules as the car. Yeah, All right. Many times these bicycle messengers are way too fast for us, and uh, we sort of have a philosophy in the bicycle squad that they'll always be out here, and so will we. So if we don't get them today, they're always going to be out there tomorrow again. They don't get enough from me on TV, man. Oh, again? Hey, look at that. This guy, you see this guy on TV? Not yet. So what you, what's up? Now you got the, the famous kid L on tape. I am the best in New York, I know that. Let me tell you something about being the best in New York. It's not about being as fast. Yeah, I am fast and all that, but it's not about being fast. It's about having a sense of direction and where you're going. If you know where you're going and you know how to get there, that's the most important thing. You ain't got to be fast. Because if you was fast, for that you go to the Tour de France and, and earn some big money. You right? What can you say? 74. Come in, 74. Can you pick that phone up and call me, please? Now, am I, am I the best messenger? I'm the best dispatcher in the world. See that right there, B? I know all that. All that right there, all that. Technically, the cops do own the streets. But in reality, we own the streets. The troopers out here, the, the messengers out here, we own the streets. I'm flying down 6th Avenue, these two cops that, on bicycles, you know, they got them little bullshit Fuji bikes with the, with the knobby wheels, all fat and all that. I'm flowing. I'm flowing, you know. I got light speed titanium frame, you know what I'm saying, white industry hubs, and, you know, my, my, my bike is like maybe 20, 20, 21 pounds. Flying. So I stopped at a light, and they pull up on me and say, yo, pull over. I said, for what? They said, you ate like six lights, and I was like, all right, where you want me to pull over? So when they looked to tell me where to pull over, I just jetted, so they started chasing me. So I'm like this, just riding, and I would look back, and I see them, <laughs> they're going like this, right? They're trying to catch up to me, and I'm just riding hard, looking at them, and I would ride to every corner and stop, and wait till they catch up. I'll wait till they like about two car lengths, then I'll take off again, and make them keep doing it for a couple of blocks, and then when I'm far away, the, you know, the fat cop is already, nah, he done gave up. All the cookies and pork chops fell out of his pockets. And um, the other cop, he's like sort of determined to try to, you know what I mean? But, you know, I'll be making fun of them at the corner, like, you ain't gonna catch me, you're not gonna catch me. It's been around since the 1890s. And they were riding track bikes on the cobblestone with fucking horses. I saw a picture of a guy who was on a track bike. 
and his face had big lines under his eyes. He looked all grouchy. It looked like he had like bike tights on and shorts, a sweatshirt. He looked just like fucking a 90s messenger. But man, he must have had it rough. It's been around a while. The track bike is the original bicycle. Back when a bicycle was first created, the Velocipede, it was a fixed gear. There were no cables or brake pads or any of that to put onto a bicycle. It just it was a fixed cog and you locked your legs to stop it. When you spin this thing, it continuously spins. So if you don't know what you're doing and you try to fly on it, it'll throw you like a horse. My name is Dexter Benjamin. I'm originally from Trinidad. I've been cycling since I was like nine years old. The first place I started riding was down a hill. And that was a great experience because I fell a lot and I bruised up myself. But that never stopped me because I now had to accomplish it because it's something that I, I like to do. I think I started in late 87, Messenger. If I'm not doing this, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm uncomfortable. You know, like if I'm depressed or anything, you know, I'll just be home sitting down on my sorrows or whatever. But then the cycling, it take me out of that. It take me out of that vicinity. It just make me feel comfortable. All my problems or whatever, just go one type of... No matter what problem I have, when I jump on my bike and I ride, it goes away. I'm 37 years of age. I lose my leg when I was like 22. Then Trinidad, coming back from my destination, this kid running behind a board, and this truck is coming up. And I just dive myself off the, off the bike to save the kid from getting hit. So my leg now hit the truck and bush. So it's only like about a half a half an inch of skin was holding on my um, my foot. So and they rushed me to the hospital so next day they took my leg off. And I wanna say part of it all over again. I'll do the same thing, you know? If I have to save somebody's life today, and I'm on the right spot at the right time, I'll do it without a second chance. Without taking a second thought that maybe if I'm gonna lose my leg or whatever. Because people's life is important, you know? And you gotta save somebody at some time. Maybe you might be the one, maybe you might be the one in the right place at the right time when somebody in in need, you know? I figure that's why I'm on the street so long. Just keep helping people and doing my job and encouraging other people and, you know? Straight up, I should make a yard, a yard and a half, which is 100, 150 bucks a day. And uh, I'm not making it. I got three kids. I don't have enough money to give them money. It makes me feel like shit about myself. And everybody else is tight, so they get tired of borrowing new money. And it just gets really depressing. It's just a really depressing aspect of life. Uh, I might be in a really good service soon where I can earn a buck 50 a day. If I earn 150 a day, then I'm making a good 750 a week. And I think that's decent. Because uh, right now, um, I'm staying at about four or five different places because I couldn't afford my apartment anymore. And it's, it's hell. Once in a blue moon, I have to stay down in the subway, in a room under the subway, and I have to come out to the street from a, a subway grating. It's the weirdest fucking shit. It's like you're coming up from a grating these Soho chicks are walking down the street with their jaws open, looking at you like you're scum. 
because you've fallen upon some hard times. And, uh, I don't know. I'm going to my 11th year of messengering. I might be in a good company soon, but I can't really see being in this whole shit for too much longer. stays down here on times when I got no money and no place to go I just uh, take my ass down here down to the room it ain't that clean it's noisy as hell down here. It's fucking hard to sleep. Here we are. You have to duck. Obviously. See how filthy it is down here? I guess this is uh, where Ray Ray uh, does his meals. Got a bunch of bike stuff down here. Used to be a courier. This is the room. I guess uh, I could pretty much say this is where my boy Ray Ray stays. And uh, oh, well, you know, he's got some cigarettes down here. Nice. Um, it's pretty gross, actually. Bike messenger drug addict turned uh, can man crackhead. Pretty strange. I can't sleep here whenever I do sleep here. But people like they, they really do kind of freak out when they see you down here. You know what I mean? They have no idea what the fuck is going on when they see a person coming up from a grating on the sidewalk. It's definitely a rough way to go. This is definitely a rough way to have to go if you need somewhere to be. It's all about the money, man. It's the money skill, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I'm out here at 7 in the morning. I come in from Parkchester, and I get lost in the city. Day in and day out until the money runs away. <laughs> I do my thing, you know what I'm saying? Dip and die through the cars, swift. Well, let them know I'm coming with my hip hip. You know that hip hip sound. You, you can hear it for three or four blocks. That's, a, that's the horn. That's the horn of the storm. I ride high, kid. I ride like a ghost. You ever seen um, 
that movie with the um with the guy that be the surfers in the water that's what's out here point break i'm the guy that goes into the sea and never come back the one that vanished <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I want to do it for the rest of my life, but it's something that I want to do now. It's fun, you know? It's like the way to stay a kid <laughs> a little bit longer. There's no, like, a boss all the time watching you. I got hit a couple of times, but no boss was broken, so it wasn't that serious. <laughs> oh, many times they just squish you between two cars or just like cut you off you know without looking the worst thing that happened is probably like losing friends on the road last uh, winter brad he was here for a couple years he was working with us and he got run over on 6th avenue and tory street by some 18 wheeler his bike was squished in half that's fucked up that's really fucked up because it wasn't his time. He still had like, you know, stuff to do. What you gonna do? A lot of people diss messengering. A lot of people diss messengering. They don't like us, they look down on us. But our family is big. Our, our family, it's probably one of the biggest. There's no waitress family. You can't go to another city and be like, oh, I'm a waitress and have another waitress give a fuck that you're a waitress. But you can go to another city as a messenger and hang out with some messengers and they'll probably say, yo, you need a couch to sleep on? Because we care about each other. I know one thing, if, if I get hit, people I don't even know that are other messengers are gonna come up and pick me up off the floor. We're a very tight community. <laughs> An alley cat race is usually formed by a guy who has a certain course in mind. He devises some rules, checkpoint rules, start rules. Alley cats and races are our way of showing love to each other because that's what we like to do. Everyone's smiling, everyone's laughing, everybody's sweating, everybody's just really fucking happy to be doing what they really like to do, which is, which is riding a lot. Races, races are phenomenal. They're, they're, they're the way of showing like who has the best skills out there. Of all the races, this is the first actual track race. No brakes allowed. This is a uh, monster track race designed by Johnny. I think it's like a really good idea for the messages with no, you know, just as specific no break race. You go out there, you pay you five dollars, you get a spoke card. That means you're, you're in the race. You put this in your spokes and you get a manifest. You go study it and make a route. This is telling you where you have to go. 225 Lafayette, 250 Hudson. You know, six places basically. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Well, I have a very close relationship with my mom, so I was telling her that I was participating in uh, a monster track bike race in New York City. I thought it would thrill her a little bit to tell her there was no brakes. And I really wanted to see her reaction, which was, that, oh my god, my daughter's riding a bike with no brakes in New York City. It just seems a little insane. So she just asked me if I wore a helmet. So as I told my mom, no, I don't wear a helmet, um, she sent me money right away. It's like, here, it's 50 bucks. Buy yourself a helmet. I'd like you to wear it in the race. I'd like you to wear it working. So I accepted the money and I did. I was intention I intended on getting a helmet. How many coming? One, two, three. You got uh, you got Katie. I got yeah, I successfully did the first two checkpoints. And um there was a third checkpoint on 18th Street, 2nd Avenue, that I flew right through. 
Well, like I said, I'm a bit stubborn and still haven't gotten the money, uh, the helmet. Uh, spent the money, sorry moms, but on, uh, I guess other things, like that $50 she sent me was the uh, amount it cost to repair my bike after getting hit by the cab. You know, some people get hit, they get traumatized, they're off the road for weeks, months, years, forever. Or some people get hit, get right back up and just like continue riding because they know that's in with the, the package of messaging. This is what we do for a living, you know? We make a living out riding our bikes every day, doing deliveries. So, in the scene, in the messenger scene, we always talk about who is the fastest guy, you know? So now, here, we're proving who is the fastest guy, who is the, the best guy on the track bike. Jack, number 59, got in the first place. I've been out here for, I've been out here long enough to go through every single block in New York at least four or five times, more, maybe more than that. I've been through these blocks many, many times. Sometimes I pedal my bike so fast, it feels like I'm, I'm in the air above, above the floor, <laughs> for real. That's how fast I'll be going. I'll be skating in New York like nothing. Central Park. All right, get all that for me, please. Central Park. That's nothing. I go right through this park like nothing, man. I know, I know the exits. People, people. Some, some messengers go through and get lost, and they're doing circles. They don't know where they're going. Man, I know this park like the back of my hand. I think the squirrels in there know me. You know what I mean? We do this every single day, day in, day out, all year round. Every single day, rain, sleet, and snow. And um. It's hard, man. It's hard, especially in New York, man. You know, if you make it in New York, man, then I, I feel you can make it anywhere. The winter was was brutal. Um, the snowstorms in the Sub Zero killed me. I finally folded about February. Uh, about February 16, I had to go into the hospital because my ankle blew out on me. So for like a month I've been off the road, now I'm just therapy riding. But the winter, this winter, this is probably one of the hardest ones on me. Um, what, what, I worked in four different companies this whole winter. Started out at Elite, went to uh, Music Man, Chick Chack, and then uh, Mothers. Mothers killed me, literally killed me. I've never done such a huge volume of work in my life. Uh, something like 36 to 40 runs a day. Then people literally, literally rode me to the ground with my injury. And uh, I'm hoping that next winter, I won't have to do this shit anymore. Because it's definitely gotta be the hardest time on a messenger. It, it like beckons you. I'm sure like anybody who has any kind of two wheels wakes up in the morning and is like, I don't believe you. <laughs> you make me tired. This can't be. And like, I could ride this, you could ride this, your friend could ride it, and his friend could ride it, and it would never tire. And so it freaks you out. It's like, you're evil. It's, it's evil. But I love it. I love to hate it. it. It hates me. A friend of mine told me, you just have to walk away. And it's a weird thought, because it's like, well, what am I going to do? Because I've been on the road for 10 years now, and every time life gets fucked up, like welfare or whatever, I get back on my fucking bike and I go out and I make some fucking money. So now I'm thinking like, well, it can't be all I can do. Uh, maybe I should go bus or fucking, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't sat down and thought about it yet. It's, uh, it's kind of scary. It's a, it's a running wheel. And I know I've said that before. It's like running faster and going fucking nowhere. Well, you know, when I started the messenger service, I thought, okay, great, you know, I'm finally gonna be making the boss's end. And I tell you, after all these, all this time, I wish I was a messenger still. Out of everything I've done in my life, that's what I wish I still was doing. So enjoy it while you got it, and be safe. 
That's the best thing. You know, uh, coming out of the day alive in one piece is the whole point of the game. my mission. So you see, look at Fogie doo -wop. Fogie doo -wop is banging, look at this. Crazy development going on right here, right now. So, uh, I love New York. Been here 35 years, never been nowhere in my life. 35 years in New York. Born on my 36, I hope I make it. And uh, this is it. Our lives is more at risk every single day, every single day, each individual than a cop. Yeah, a cop's life is on the line. He carries his gun. You know, they, they get themselves in situations, whatever. But a messenger, from the moment he hits Manhattan and he's on his bike, he's in danger. I don't recommend messenger work to anybody. If you can get another job, if you can finish school, if you can become a doctor, lawyer, whatever, anything to stay away from messenger work, you should do that. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of my friends die doing this work. One person asked me, how long would I be, would I be writing for? From no one, like, if I'll be writing, like, for the next five years or 10 years. And I turn and say, I'll be writing until the last breath leave my body. So, which means I could be 90 years old and I could still pedal my bike, I would ride. That's how much I really into riding. You know? As much as I praise this business, I also feel that I'm turning into a machine. I'm turning into a spinning robot that just moves and moves and moves and moves and moves and has no emotion anymore and I'm turning inhuman. Now in the future, oh God, do I hate to say it. I see myself dispatching. I see myself sitting on a computer with the whole city inside of my brain with maybe 20 riders, sending them around and hooking them up. It's a subculture. It's more than just a career. It's like you feel that if you leave, you will be like dissing your subculture by leaving. Because constantly I talk about, yeah, I'm going to get out of this shit, blah, 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 blah. And I wake up in the morning, and I see them two wheels, and I want to get out there and, and be on it again. So I should just quit talking shit and just be like, I am a messenger, and I'm always going to be a messenger.